Fun. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special live broadcast with our favorite resident psychologist, who has been such a dear friend and supporter of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, none other than, as we call him, DDL for short, Dr. Doug Lyle. Thank you so much for being here to answer everyone's questions. So appreciate it. My great pleasure, AJ, as always. Great. So thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to take myself off screen as soon as I answer the first question, because we'd much rather look at Dr. Lyle. So the first question is from Amy, and she says, I have no problem putting down salt, sugar, and flour, but I have an extremely hard time letting go of oil. I do not have an issue with nuts because I'm allergic to them. I love guacamole when it is available, but I do not search it out. Oil is my downfall. Why am I so addicted to it and how can I let it go? <laughs> well, um, you're addicted to it because it's the highest calorie substance on earth. So uh, that's our problem. And if we looked carefully, we would generally find that it isn't the oil all by itself. It's usually in combination with some spices. Uh, and you don't just take, you, know, you don't, you're not addicted to taking a bottle of olive oil and just opening up the, the top and guzzling it. So it's the fact that it will raise the overall fat content of whatever food is that you're eating uh, by a lot. So if you're eating some food that is, you know, if you're eating a potato, a potato is 1% fat. But if we make it in French fries, then suddenly we've turned those calories into maybe 50 or 60% fat. So um, you're, you're designed by nature to like the taste of fat, uh, not in isolation, or else people would just, you know, take a little big old scoops of lard. Uh, but it's actually in combination with other chemicals, uh, which is how it's found in nature. So the, the problem Amy's having is the problem that the whole world has, which is that once you discover oil, oil doctors things up and, and makes it far richer. And, uh, and therefore, you're going to like it better. It's, it's a super normal stimulus. And the way out is the same way out for every supernormal stimulus. Uh, the way out is through an abstinence process where you <clears throat> get rid of it and you have to brace yourself for the, the fit that your nervous system is going to throw. So whether you're trying to get away from heroin or cigarettes or alcohol uh, or coffee or oil, it's all the same process. So the nervous system throws a fit. Uh, it throws a fit in relation to how intense the stimuli is that it is that it has been dealing with uh, in terms of its disruption to to pleasure chemistry. So something like heroin has an or morphine, the, the opiates have an extremely intense response, and therefore the nervous system has to brace itself for that extraordinary response, and therefore uh, it sets up. Uh, essentially neurochemical defenses against that. Uh, the same thing is true with cigarettes. So uh, you, you, don't, <clears throat> you don't just put down cigarettes. Your, your nervous system has uh, essentially engineered a chemical defense against nicotine. And uh, so it is bracing itself for the nicotine when you hit it, uh, when it hits you. And if you don't smoke, uh, the bracing is still there and that, that bracing or neurochemical defense against the nicotine is what we call craving. So the same thing is going to be true in rich food. So if you make the food rich, your whole digestive system uh, is being orchestrated by your brain. Uh, the brain is expecting there to be very, very rich food, and so therefore it's bracing itself or getting ready to deal with it. If you don't give it to it, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. In the same way, a cigarette smoker is uncomfortable if, if they expect to smoke and then they don't have to smoke. Uh, the, the craving, you know, is very disturbing and it lasts for a given period of time, uh, minutes, and it may re then recur and come and come and go in waves. As the system says, well, it looks like there's not a cigarette here, and it may calm down, and but then you know, half an hour later, it rises again. Like, isn't this about time for a cigarette? Isn't this about where we, when we would have expected it? So that same kind of recurring anticipation will go on if you've been eating food with oil in it. And it's going to go on for, you know, certainly at a fairly high level for a week or so. Uh, probably by the end of week two, it's, 
uh, th that response has quieted down quite a bit. Um, that's what we're going to call extinction. So you will have gone into an extinction process uh, if you, you know, so it doesn't mean it's all way gone away. It just means that it's 80% gone. It's no longer at the same level of craving. But the cravings can still be there uh, at a mild degree. And then if you indulge them, then you bring back this conditioned paradigm pretty quickly and the cravings get intense again. So that's how it works. And that's why that's why it works that way. And that's just how it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it does, you. Make, it does sense. make sense. You always, you said, always we're said we're designed, we're designed to eat the most calorically concentrated food in the environment, and oil is literally the most concentrated food ever created. So yes. thank you. Makes perfect sense. So Michelle wants to know, why does she feel compelled to eat bad stuff, but only in private, the car, the garage, with the wrappers always hidden? You know, it's interesting because my mother was morbidly obese, and we never saw her eat. Right. I, mean, I mean, we saw her eat, but she never we could never figure out what she was eating to be, you know, 400 pounds. And then, you know, when she died, we found all these like McDonald's wrappers and, you know, things in, in her car. So um, this is a great question and I'd love to hear your answer. Sure. Uh, I worked with a, a parapsychologist, actually a social worker and a psychologist in an office and uh, they were both obese. And at lunch, they would, go into the refrigerator and they would bring out like a head of romaine lettuce and some tomatoes and they would wash the lettuce. And I remember, I remember them tearing the romaine lettuce leaves off and saying, what a beautiful lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know where this is going. Like there's no way these women were supporting hundred pound overweight bodies on romaine lettuce. That's what was, wasn't happening. Um, this was in the, the prison system that I worked at for 10 years. Uh, one day a colleague of mine was working in, in uh, one, of their, one of those two, one of these ladies' offices. <laughs> and I uh, was seeing a client in there, just needed an office space, and, and uh, this, this, this lady psychologist didn't have any, anywhere else to go, so she was in, uh, she was in this lady's office. And... She came and told me, she said, man, if we ever have, if we ever have a siege where, you know, the prisoners riot, you need to go into Ms. LeBron's office. Because <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, if you open that drawer looking for a pen, you better be ready for what you're going to see. <laughs> okay. So obviously and compassionately, we can look at the situation that makes perfect sense. The, uh, the pleasure trap is the pleasure trap. You're just as AJ just said, we're, we're drawn to eat the richest caloric food in the environment. No surprise. If, however, uh, we live around people that understand the reason why we're having that problem is because we're eating food that's too rich and <clears throat> we are trying to to essentially advertise that we're aware of this, that we're working on everything that can be done, and we are diligent, intelligent, and conscientious about what we're doing. Then what we, that means is, is that in public, we lay out little strips of romaine lettuce and comment about the beautiful lettuce. And meanwhile, when we disappear into our office, <laughs> we're eating bags of Halloween candy, okay? so. That's what this is, and uh, very understandable. And I understand that, uh, that this individual is struggling with this. The pleasure trap is no joke. Uh, very difficult to quiet down its its uh, influence. And so all all you can do is uh, you know keep keep trying to put more healthy food in you to crowd out the other food, and and hopefully you can get into what we call a deep groove where your visits to the rich food are minimized. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. And people are watching all the way from Tokyo and they say they love your laugh. So ah. You look like Alan Alda when you laugh. I oh, don't know why that is. Crazy. It's so cute. So Jane says, how do you break a habit of snacking? It seems to stem from anxiety and or lack of sleep. 
Um, there's really not a problem with snacking per se. There's no reason for you to not eat a snack. And if you're anxious, uh, you may you may feel a desire to chew and eat something, and the <clears throat> a little bit of of a dorphin that you're going to get from uh, eating a little bit of food may calm you down a bit. Um, that's fine. If it's not like it's not like those calories are not being cataloged. They are being uh, they're being recorded very perfectly in your nervous system. So it's not as if uh, let's suppose you ate a snack. And two hours later, you were doing a food diary on your day, and you forgot that you put the snack in there. And so you added up the calories, and you'd, you'd eat 1,900 calories. And then you went home later, and you're like, oh, I forgot that snack. That's right. That was 200 calories. God, I forgot. Okay? Well, relax. Your nervous system didn't forget. Uh, you, you, that means that you will eat 200 calories less in the subsequent 24 hours uh, after having eaten that snack than had you not eaten that snack. So the, the sort of lay public's notion is that snacking is a naughty thing, that we should only be eating at meals, and that we should you know, take care to not be snacking. This is totally ludicrous and makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Uh, no animal behaves this way. Animals don't don't uh, monitor their intake and and make sure that they don't overeat by consciously paying attention to not eating, all, you know, and making sure they only eat at certain times. That's completely ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, so snacking is never a problem. Uh, the, the the problem is always the same problem. What are you snacking? <laughs> it's it's the content. Okay. That's the issue. So if you're snacking on healthy food, not a problem. It's being appropriately recorded and given given full credit in your nervous system. Uh, if you eat overly rich food, uh, your your nervous system may not be able to actually understand what it ate uh, in terms of its full calorie value, uh, and you may that may contribute to you systematically overeating. So that's the issue with snacking. Never worry about it. Uh, the it, it is probably the case that you are probably healthier if you were to eat seven times a day than eating three times a day. Okay, so uh, that that is what the, the research evidence would suggest. How big of a difference? Not much. Uh, by far, the biggest difference would be what are you eating? Okay, so just pay attention to what you're eating. Make sure that whatever you're eating is healthy food. And don't worry about when you're eating it, or how many times, or, or frankly, how much. Yeah, I, thank you. And that's why I didn't want to ask the questions that we've had about intermittent fasting, because I know that you say it doesn't matter when we eat, how much we eat, but just what we eat. Sure. All yes, right. that, that's correct. The um, yeah, intermittent fasting is is a concept that that has no scientific support for the notion that it's going to help anybody reduce the amount of food that they eat. Uh, I think that anecdotally, uh, once in a while, it may be a useful concept uh, accidentally. In other words, not, not because intermittent fasting is useful per se, but because it may, in occasional cases, uh, it may interrupt a pattern of cramming. Uh, and, and a conditioned cram. It may assist people in counter conditioning or extinguishing a conditioned cram pattern. So, uh, but the problem is the conditioned cram, it's not the feeding window. Okay, so uh, yeah, the, the concept of a feeding window being a useful, a useful idea in order to helping people limit their food intake, et cetera, this is just makes, makes absolutely no sense. It's contrary to biology. Right. I, I mean, some of the people are saying it creates something, I don't know, autophagy or that will live longer or, you know, maybe it'll just seem like it. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is, uh, the, pe people are getting excited about this notion of effectively uh, of toxicity. And they're, they, they've read Walter Longo uh, jumping up and down about fasting. Uh, I, I think it's, it's safe to say that we know more about fasting than anybody. <laughs> I think that's very clear. Uh, I think Longo's done some interesting rat research with chemotherapy uh, drugs 
and good for him. And you know, I, I applaud uh, research and science uh, to try to improve our understanding. Uh, but we know more than anybody knows about this topic. Okay, and we see that in extended water fasting, uh, you will get you get value. The the notion that you're going to get a, a bunch of detox taking place because you cram the feeding window into seven or five or 11 or whatever the hell it is hours a day. And therefore you increase the detoxification process. And this is going to help lengthen the life of the animal is absurd. It is 100% speculative. It has no, no support whatsoever. So uh, that's completely different than the notion of a more extended fast uh, that would be outside the normal ranges for the animal's eating pattern that would result in a, in a ketosis uh, that, that would take place and now start a process of detoxification, which is what takes place in water fasting. So if, if someone were going to make the case that, you know, twice a month they were to fast for two days and that they, that they believed that, that, you know, that they had research evidence that this was mildly improving some um, some you know health parameters that they were measuring. Um, I would I would believe it. I would believe that the effect would be mild, uh, and I uh, and I would believe that. But I wouldn't be surprised about that effect. If somebody came to me and said, uh, "I believe I've got evidence that by having a person not eat for 16 hours a day, as opposed to not eating for 12 hours a day." But the additional four hours of not uh, digesting food by, by lengthening the length of time between feeding that I have evidence this is health supportive, I would say, you know, you're smoking crack. There's no way. Okay. And, uh, and so right, right now, no such evidence exists. To totally theoretical and speculative. And it's an absurd proposition that should be, sh should be viewed through the lens of nothing other than than uh, wild speculation that one day may find out to have a very very small effect size and probably won't. It won't Great. even Thank come close to the effect sizes that we would look at as, uh, that we that would be observable the difference between let's say a pretty healthy diet and a very healthy diet. So no, I, I think it's a bogus idea. Just give up on the whole idea. Great. Thank you. Someone live, though, is asking, is stopping eating at a certain time before bed a good idea for sleep, even if it's not for intermittent fasting or weight loss? I don't think so. Um, I don't think that there's any support for that. The, the, um, I think that uh, um, that might be interesting. I, I, I'd be willing to, to look at any, at any uh, evidence that suggested otherwise. I think it's going to be hard to find any evidence at all that that goes anywhere. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me that this would be an unhealthy process. Why would it be unhealthy for an animal to eat before it goes to sleep if it has the ability to do so? It makes no sense. Well, I would say just from somebody that suffers with things like reflux and IBS that, yeah. that, that our, our gastroenterologists have told us mm -hmm. to have three to five hours. Oh, that that makes sense. If if you've got if you've got uh, ask, you know if you've got reflux, so you've got uh, you've got some problem with the esophagus. So you've got a you know just in the same way that I would tell you to put some bricks under the head of your bed and raise it up three inches to help the reflux as well. In other words, so if we're going to be we're, we're mechanically addressing the fact that we've got a pathology, then there's absolutely reasons to do things differently. That's an entirely different argument than saying that there's a general species-wide health advantage for doing that. Uh, there's no health advantage from raising the head of your bed, per se. Okay. So, but if you happen to have acid reflux, it can be fabulous. It can be an extremely useful technique. Great. Thank you. Janine says, what is the best way I explain to friends and family what food addiction is or the pleasure trap without saying that they too are food addicts? The word addict really puts up a wall. And from what I understand about the pleasure trap, we are all addicted except for the rare person. 
My parents are not obese, but they are not slim either. But I'd bet a thousand dollars that they would not be happy if I took away all their processed food. Are they food addicts by definition or just stuck in the pleasure trap or both? Well, let's talk about this. The pleasure trap is really the story of addictive process around food. That's what it is. Now, addiction. Is, so let's let's. Uh, yeah, Aristotle said two thousand years ago. Before we have an argument, let's make sure we define our terms. So the, the problem is, is that 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 words can lock us in to to a position um, that is. Uh, that is what we're going to call discrete rather than a continuum. So that's why we say someone is tall. We don't say you're six foot three point two seven four seven three with a bar over it inches. Okay, that's not what we say. We say they're tall. That's what we do. We don't say someone is fat. You know, we don't say someone. Oh, he can run the forty yard dash at four point six three two four seven. You know, it was his last time. No, we say he's very fast. That's what we do. So we use words to communicate with each other. And in, in that, what we do is we turn what we're going to call continuous variables into discrete variables. All short instead of giving everybody height in centimeters. Okay. So in the same way, uh, addiction is a categorical term. Okay, it's like, wow, you're either addicted or you're not addicted. Okay, it's like, well, now, wait a second. What are we trying to say here? Uh, what we're trying to say in the pleasure trap is that super normal stimuli will create a process where the person's motivation to pursue it will be out of balance with their best interest. That's what we're trying to say. The, the more potent the, the disruption or the more, more potent the super normal stimuli is, the, the, the greater of the, of the intensity of the response, okay? And therefore, the greater the possibility for an addictive process. So incidentally, just because it's super normal doesn't mean you're going to be addicted to it. It has to be something super normal that catches the pleasure pathways, okay? So it's going to have to be something that is a hyperstimulator of the dopamine pathway or the hyperstimulator of the endorphin pathway, uh, something that hyperstimulates your bruising response you know what I mean? Because we put you into a machine that pummels you. You're not going to be addicted to that, even though it's a super normal stimulus. Okay? Now, so, uh, so now we're going to look at food. And uh, is this lady's parents, are they, quote, addicted? Well, are they having a super normal stimuli that is essentially causing them to chase a pleasure response that is doing, you know, directing them towards food? that is not in their best interest. Yes, that's true. Uh, if we were to simply point that out to them and say, oh, well, it turns out you'd be better off. You would feel better, look better, live longer, and have less possibility of debilitating disease if you were to eat this food instead. What would their response be? Don't want to do it. Why? Don't want to give the, up the pleasure. Why? Because I'm used to eating food that is super normal and hyperactivates the dopamine pathway. Ah, you're addicted. Okay, that's what we mean by the pleasure trap. The pleasure trap is a generalized term that is a description of the of the of the addictive process. The uh, so yes, food uh, the modern food supply is addictive. It's addictive mildly. Uh, it's it is not as addictive as cigarettes. People's people's withdrawal symptoms from getting out of nicotine are more intense than they are from getting out of rich food. It's of the same order of magnitude, you know what I mean? They're, I think cigarettes are tougher. Um, cigarettes are not as tough as, as someone struggling with alcohol. Uh, alcohol is, is quite a bit tougher than cigarettes. People that have gone through cigarettes will swear up and down, it's the hardest thing they ever did, but that's because they didn't get out of an alcohol alcoholic problem. That's a lot harder, okay? So people that have worked with addictions at all ranges understand this, and you know, I've spent a career, I've, I've treated many, many people of, of, of addictions of literally, I think, every kind that you would know of. And, um, and I can tell you that the hard drugs are by far the hardest thing that there is. It's just unbelievably hard. And alcohol comes close. The, uh, so alcohol is pretty tough. And then 
then cigarettes are way easier, a completely different order of magnitude. And then underneath cigarettes, you got chocolate. Okay, <laughs> that's what you got. The, uh, you know, coffee is right in there along with food. It's very similar. Uh, the, so I think, I think caffeine is probably, has a dopamine impact at about the same level as a piece of coffee cake. So the, uh, yeah, that's what this is. That's how to look at it. It's, it's mildly, mildly addictive, but that doesn't mean that the effects are mild. If you're, if you're 80 pounds overweight and you've had a heart attack, you know, and you're in trouble and you're having a hard time giving up the rich food, you know, the, the degree of the addictive response is not intense. Uh, it's just enough to keep you in the track. Okay. And uh, that, that's, so that is what we're talking about. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, oh my God, you didn't move. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I want to interrupt you. Thank you. Okay, terrific. And a trap it is indeed. So Dr. Lyle, what is the best method for teaching children to prefer whole natural food in this modern environment? Completely withholding processed foods if possible, or will the restriction eventually lead to rebellion later? You know, I, I would just in your own house, I'd be feeding kids healthy food. I'd be feeding them things that were, um, uh, I wouldn't be trying to have my kids SOS free. I mean, that, that's, that's putting the bar way too far and so, so discrepant from anything else that they're ever going to eat. Your job is to try to get a lot of healthy food in your kids. The, uh, I wouldn't have junk food in the house. Uh, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but the, but, I, but neither would I not have, I wouldn't say, well, we're not going to have peanut butter and jam in this house and, and Ezekiel bread because it's too, because it's artificially concentrated and too rich. No, I wouldn't do that. The, uh, have healthy food in the house. Your, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see to it that these kids you know, don't wind up as little toxic waste dumps from just extraordinarily uh, unhealthy diets. Uh, myself personally, my parents didn't know any better. I was raised on conventional food. My parents were probably worse than average. Uh, my mom was a very disinterested cook and therefore she was never going to make a salad and she was never going to steam up any vegetables. You know, so I, I ate a pretty high animal food dominated diet and I had an appendicitis by the time I was 13. The, um, you know, this, no surprise. It was, this was a very, very rich diet. The, um, what was I going to say about this? Now, you know, not great for you. Uh, not great to have an ex uh, that much, that much trouble. Hell, it could have killed me, literally. Uh, so had there not been uh, a, a modern surgery and ability to diagnose that and sterile technique that happened to be discovered in the 1860s or 70s, it's like, hell, I would have been dead. What do you know about that? Uh, or very possibility could have died of peritonitis at 13 years old. So, the um, so the food is you know obviously we don't want kids um, uh, with with big time nasty pathologies you know, because the diet is so bad. Make sure the diet is decent. Make sure it's dominated by healthy food. But don't worry about fine details at all. And the notion that we have to that, that this is where the notion of addiction. Uh, this is why that word is problematic, and you, you'll watch me raise my eyebrow about it and walk away from that concept. Uh, I will say that rich food is addiction, addictive-like, okay? And I'm trying to signal to people that addictive, not addictive, this is a dichotomy. We're acting like these are discrete issues rather than a continuum. It's a continuum of supernormal stimuli of which foods are at a very – mild level. You don't have to think, oh my God, I can't, you know, you would not want your seven-year-old um, experimenting with heroin. You, you wouldn't want that nervous system to put up with something like that. I and mean, then we wind up with a heroin addict for the rest of their lives. Okay. That's not the same thing as food. It's not anywhere close to this. So your children, you know, when they get up and move away in their twenties, they're going to make their own choices. And they are certainly going to be exposed to rich food all along through their lives. 
So it's not like, oh my God, I don't want them to ever have that because it's going to be like heroin and they're going to be addicted. No, don't think of it that way. Your job is to try to make sure that they eat a healthy enough diet that their diet is with their healthy kids. And that when they go away from home, they're used to eating a lot of healthy food. They're going to make all kinds of different choices. Uh, but you want them to know what's healthy and what isn't healthy. And But we don't want them... We don't want fear mongering going on to, to the point where they roll their eyeballs at their parents. Like, you've got to be kidding me. If I have some French fries or if I have a hamburger, uh, I'm going to die of cancer and heart disease? No, I don't think so. And they're right. If they look to the left and they look to the right, they look at everybody in the sun, the people are eating garbage and they're, they're fine. Okay, so you're not going to terrorize your child. You want to have a reasonable concept that you can defend, which is that in the long run, these aren't a good thing. We try to stay away from them, try to eat healthy food instead. Uh, and we feel better, you know, and I feel better and they'll feel it. So they'll feel the difference in there. We, we point out the correlation coefficient uh, as to what it feels like after you've eaten a bunch of rich food versus when you've eaten healthy food, it feels different. And so we, we, we educate them. We sort of point that out. They'll experience it. And for the rest of their lives, they'll have a little conscious internal bar barometer that they'll be able to notice. And hopefully, um, without any fear mongering, they will, their, their long-term choices will be reasonably wise. That's how we want to handle it. Okay. I think sometimes, Dr. Lyle, the problem is for some of our uh, members, having even healthy, rich food is a problem for them. Right. Just, and so it's not that they're trying to deny their kids peanut butter, jam, and Ezekiel, but yes. they're the ones that are getting into it too often. Totally different issue. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. That, well, I'm yeah. understanding that and every, every individual has to manage that conflict their own way. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, that, but let's not, it's not, it's not confuse the issues. Okay. So, uh, there's no great damage from your kids eating some modest quantity of even conventional food. That's not going to be any big problem. But if the problem is with you, then then that's something that that's something that has to be factored into how it is that we run a household. Right. I think the managing of the environment is the hardest part. And from what I understand from you, there's not just one way to do it. It's going to depend on the individual personalities. And that might be a reason that somebody would want to book a private consultation with you because my answer, which is just get divorced, is not very helpful to <laughs> most people. I'm just kidding. I'm not saying that. But, but you know, me, I'm kind of black and white. And it's like, yeah. just don't allow the crap in. And I know it's easier said than done with some of the people in their complicated relationships. So they would probably need to speak to you privately about how they're going to uniquely manage their environment so that they can get their needs met and also accommodate the other family yes, members. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a tough one. So yeah, Carol, yeah, Carol says, if I fully and wholeheartedly believe that a whole food plant-based diet is the best diet on earth, why can't I stick to it? If I believe exercise is definitely good for me, why don't I do it? Why don't I do what I know is good for me? And why do I continue to do the things that are harmful? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the reason is, is that what your, uh, what your mind is, is your mind is a device for running cost benefit analysis. And that, that's what a brain is of an animal. An, animal uh, an animal's brain is precisely nothing other than a cost-benefit computer. That's what it does. And so that cost-benefit computer, obviously it has to have a way to analyze costs and it has to have a way to analyze benefits. And so the way it analyzes costs and benefits is with pleasure and pain. That's, that's more or less what it is. And so, you know, there, there, there's other aspects to this, but fundamentally, that's exactly how an animal nervous system works. Uh, it's more complicated than that in that, uh, so, uh, I don't know, a gazelle that's eating grass on the African savanna, uh, it's, it's, got, it's, it's experiencing the pleasure of eating the grass, but it looks up and it sees a cheetah 300 yards away. And even though that cheetah is not causing it any pain now, the animal has the ability to, to run the statistical possibility on that and therefore a certain amount of uh, a disturbing 
psychological experience or feeling will arise in the system that we call anxiety. And so it will run the anxiety against the pleasure of the eating, and its brain is to run the, the calculus about which should be dominant, okay? Because there's two decisions. We either stop eating or we keep eating. Now that's the choice. Now, <clears throat> so you can see what the mind is. The mind is analyzing probabilities. Uh, and it doesn't know that it's doing it. No, no, no Thompson's gazelle can do math. But what they do is that they do the equivalent of math. Sounds, sounds magical. Sounds like that. It's like it's impossible. How could it do it? It does it in the same way that you have a speedometer on your car. Okay, so there's a formula in physics called distance equals rate times time. And so if you were to uh, measure how far the car has moved by, by measuring the size of the wheel and how fast it goes around, and then in, three, in the last two seconds, you went, you know, I don't know, 87 feet, then it could calculate if you had a computer that could do this, which we do, you could have a computer that would say, ah, we went 56 miles an hour in the last two seconds, okay? And then two seconds later, you put on your brakes and you only went 42, 42 feet and say, ah, you're going 32 miles an hour. So you could have a speedometer that worked that way, but that's not what we have in our car. What we have in our car is a trick, okay? What we have is a device that as your wheel goes around, it generates an electric current. And the electric current, the, the high, higher the amount of current, the faster you're going. The lower the current, the slower you're going. So what they do is they simply plot that the, the, the intensity of the current on an analog scale. And if the current is, is that high, then it knows you're doing 70 miles an hour. If the current is about there, it knows you're doing 50. And if the current's there, it knows you're doing 15. There's no math. No mathematics. No, nobody's computing distance equals rate times times. It just works. Okay. It's what we're going to call an analog computer. You could also call it a bag of tricks. So what the nervous system is of all animals is they are bags of tricks. That's what they are. Now, somebody like me will explain that they're a cost-benefit analytic engine, that they're a very sophisticated computer. But that's not, you know, you know a computer scientist would say, well, what do you mean? Where's the computations? And I would say, ah, the computations were done in evolution. And what this thing simply has is what we're going to call feelings, okay? So it has feelings, and those feelings are the evidence of the computations that are nothing other than a bag of tricks as it analyzes probabilities. And the feelings that you have are things like pleasure and pain, as well as the anticipation of the pain. You are not designed by nature to be worried about having a heart attack 30 years from now because the food that you're eating is too rich. Nope. You're not designed by nature to know that if you're eating rich food, you're going to be overweight and you're not going to look good in a bathing suit next summer and, you know, maybe your mate leaves you. Nope. These are not part, part, parts and parcel of the computational systems that are embedded in that brain. They're not in there. Okay. So what can you do? You can also learn things that are connected to each other that are bizarre. Okay, so you can, somebody can tell you, oh, the rich food can make you overweight. Really? Oh, well, I don't want to be overweight, so maybe I don't want to eat the rich food. Except that your nervous system says that the rich food is the most valuable thing in your environment. Because the number one problem in nature was death by starvation. So therefore, you're, you have a mechanism that is extremely good at analyzing the richness of that food, and it's going to encourage you to go after it at, you know, at the, at the exclusion of other foods, right into the teeth of dangerous circumstances, including that cheetah, to get it, okay? So you weren't designed to make the decisions that we are asking you to make. That's the problem. You were designed for an environment of scarcity. You were designed by nature to follow your instincts. We are telling you, don't follow your instincts. You weren't designed to want to exercise. You are designed to try to avoid exercise. That's what every animal does. That's why every predator goes after the weak, the, weak, the sick, the slow, the isolated, and the injured. They do that automatically because they're trying to avoid exercise. 
okay? They're trying to get the most energy, i.e. food and calories, for the least amount of effort. That's what they're trying to do. So uh, nature and animal nervous systems are being run by the principle of the conservation of energy. That's what they're designed to do. That includes you. That's the reason why you want to eat the rich food, even though you know it's not in your best interest uh, long term. It was always in your best interest long term for every other one of your ancestors, except maybe your mother. Okay. So the instincts in you are telling you eat the rich food, leave the vegetables and the fruit behind. Okay. The instincts are telling you don't exercise for God's sake. Sit right back here. Don't do anything if you don't have to. The instincts are telling you to sit in front of the TV with a with a box full of ding dongs. Okay. And ignore the apples and the pears and the bananas that you have on the counter. Like forget it. Eat the box of ding dongs until you feel sick. And for God's sakes, don't go upstairs to brush your teeth. Like just forget about it. Just wait till those teeth are till you go to bed. Then struggle upstairs later. And you know, do it then. But don't don't go to any extra effort. Okay? Because we only want to go upstairs once. <laughs> you got it? So if, if this is you, which th this person's writing here, um, struggling with this, of course you're having a problem. That's why the pleasure trap was written. It was written to as a message to say the reason why we are self-destructive isn't because we've got psychological problems. Doesn't mean that we are badly designed. Doesn't mean that we are people with flaws. All, all of the opposite is true. We are almost perfectly designed. There's nothing about our histories that are causing this problem in terms of our personal histories or tragedies. The reason why you're having trouble doing this is because you're going against every instinct that's in you. That's the problem, okay? Which is why what we have to do, as AJ will say repeatedly, Get control of your environment, so the only thing that's in that environment are good choices. Okay, and as far as exercise goes, you know you kind of have want to find something that uh, has some secondary appeal to it. So if I if I was having to quote go to the gym and exercise, I'd never do it. Okay, but I don't. I go to the gym to play basketball, which is something that I like doing, and uh, I like to score points and have everybody say, "Ooh, well, dead <laughs> no guy can shot." <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, theoretically out there, there's some date that I might have someday where I could say, oh, I could play basketball. And she'll say, wow, really? Can I watch you sometime? I'm like, yeah. Want to go to the gym now? <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> okay. So that, that's what's going on inside of heads. Or even the exercise at the root of it has some pleasure-seeking mechanism circulating around in the back of the, of the bird brain. That's, that's, that's great. So speaking of exercise, there's actually two questions on exercise. They're, they're very similar, so I'll read them both. Andrea says she's having a difficult time getting into an exercise routine and would like any advice on how to establish one that she can stick to for a long time. And Joelle asks, what is the best way to create a habit like exercise or meditation, for example? And what is the best way to go back quickly to this habit when we have to interrupt it, for example, because of travel? Yeah, um, I, I would say that exercise is, is best done every day which is different than a lot of people are doing. So what people are doing is that they're, you know, a lot of times they're saying, well, I ought to go to the gym three times a week. Um, this is not a smart way to do things. Uh, what we want to do is we want to have exercise to be a daily practice. That So it's there's not a question of whether we're going to exercise today or not. The answer is yes, we're going to. And therefore, it's not something that we're tacking on to our day, it's something that it's it's a we, we don't do this with, with respect to eating, and we don't do this with respect to brushing your teeth. It's like, well, I don't know, am I going to brush my teeth tonight or not? No, that's not how we do it. We're just going to do it, and so uh, so therefore we're going to make the time for it, and we're going to make it sort of a daily priority. So uh, it doesn't have to be a long thing. It could be twenty minutes walking around your block. Um, it could be twenty minutes if you put the dance music on. You know, maybe, maybe before dinner, okay? So there's, there's some time that's convenient enough. The, the, it doesn't have to be this huge deal. 
But you know, 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, get yourself some exercise and, and do it daily. The, uh, that's, that's the best strategy uh, if you're someone who has never incorporated this into a routine. Other people will find things that they love to do. That's, that's ideal. So it's not, a, it's not a duty like toothbrushing, you know what I'm saying, and, and uh, shaving and things like that. There's things that we do that are sort of dutiful processes. And for some of us, you know, we're not that interested in physical activity and it's just going to be a dutiful process. Fine. Then make it a 15 to 20 minute a day dutiful process and find some way to make it pleasant. Maybe you'll listen to a podcast uh, while you're doing it, or maybe you'll watch, you know, some TV or maybe you'll just listen to some music. Um, you know, find some way to, to make this process more, more pleasant. But yeah, I would say that the number one thing is we're not tacking it on. It's not meant to be an optional thing. It's meant to be a daily, a daily practice. Mm. That's, you know, if it's not a daily practice, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to really work out hard three days a week and then take three days off. No, don't do it that way. Work out moderately so that you're not exhausted every day, you know, or sore. Uh, then you can't do it the next day. Yeah, we're going to work. We're going to simply work these muscles and work this body moderately for a moderate period of time. Doesn't have to be long. That's the daily practice of exercise. There's no reason not to do it. You put on some music. You know what I'm saying? Put on some music and dance and do some calisthenics. That you do that for 20 minutes and, and listen to some Beatles or whatever it is that you you, you know, will get you moving. The, uh, that's how to do this thing. I love it that you said it must be a daily practice. And I agree with you because that's when I watch all the juicy stuff on Netflix. I only let myself do it when I'm on the bike and then yeah. the bike gets done. Yes. I think if people would attach their uh, television to their exercise equipment, they and that would be the only way they could get to work the TV, I think everybody would be exercising. If that would be the only way they could check their email, you know? Yes. So that's kind of cool. Thank you. Kat asks, or well, she says, Dr. Lyle has spoken in the past about situations in which he has procrastinated in academic settings. And it turned out to be a good thing because the duties he was being asked to perform became obsolete or irrelevant. But what makes us procrastinate when it comes to our health and eating? For example, I'll cook something later. I'm busy having fun right now, but later you're starving. So you make a bad choice because you're too hungry to cook. Yeah, it's the same process. You're the uh, procrastination, you're fiddling around and not wanting to impose a cost on yourself because you, you may not have to, uh, you, may, you may get away with it. So it's the same, same strategy exactly. Uh, our, our minds are not very good at being able to sort of read the cues. So people will procrastinate paying their mortgage in the same way that they procrastinate, you know, filling out some silly form that probably isn't going to matter. And they will, they will do that. And it turns out that, oh, you have to pay the mortgage. So now we're up against it time-wise. We're rushing around and we're worried about whether it's late and everything else on the sun. So people, some, sometimes you, you have to consciously recognize that there's things that are going to happen and that it makes sense to actually attack those things early. It's actually uh, things that are going to happen that are necessary for them to happen uh, and that will happen, that they are duties that you're going to have to do. The ideal strategy for those is to do them immediately. The reason why that's true is that you want to maximize your flexibility in the remaining time. The, uh, for things that you don't have to do that are not necessary, you will find yourself um, actually fiddling and you'll fiddle along an ingenious payoff matrix. Um, what, let me, let me explain the logic of this so that you understand how your brain works and then we'll circle back around this problem. The, uh, you could, let's suppose that you're a student and there's a paper due at the end of November and it's like a 20 page term paper. It's this big deal. Okay. And it's like 25% of your grade, and this is what you're going to do. So in that 30 days, and let's suppose it's November 1st. So uh, November 1st, you get the assignment of what you're supposed to write on. 
So on November 1st, you could go home and you could write this thing. You could spend the next three days. It takes you three days to write it. So you just knocked out November 1st, November 2nd, and November 3rd, and you did this thing. Now, pretty good feeling because it's done. So now the rest of the month, you get to optimize your behavior. So if, I don't know, Elton John comes to town, you know, and your friend says, hey, can you want to go? You could say, yeah, I can go because my work's done. I don't have to, you know, there's nothing else I have to do. So you, you sort of optimize your flexibility by getting everything you can get done out of your hair. However, what you've done is you've actually, you've done this suboptimally. And the reason is, is that there's some chance in the next, you know, three weeks that we'll find out that we don't have to do this paper. It turns out that the prof says, boy, people are having such time, such a tough time. You know, it's now it's the 12th of November. Probably nobody's hardly done it. So, you know what? I'm just pulling that out of the class. You guys have just got too much to do. Well, what if you spent three days doing it? You'd be like, God, I should have procrastinated. Then I would have had those three days and I wouldn't have had to spend them doing this. So what you, the mind does is it actually will fiddle for a while and it will give it a chance to find out whether or not we're going to get a break. Now you can see the problem. You, you could fiddle all the way to the 27th of November. That would give you three days left. If you have maximized the opportunity for this thing to go up and smoke and not have to do it. But now there's three days left in the month, 28th, 29th, and 30th. You don't have any choice. You have to do this paper now. It's going to take the next three days. Now Elton John comes to town and your friend says there's tickets. Too bad. It's your favorite artist. You really would have wanted to go. It's the last tour. It's a lifetime experience. You don't get to go. Why? Because you procrastinated too long. Now the human mind has a sense of this. So it fiddles pretty close to the end to optimize the opportunity of taking advantage of the fiddling. And then it starts hustling when it starts to get up against it. Okay. That's that you'll observe this in yourself. This is an ingenious algorithm that, that sits inside of the human mind. Now, what we want to do is we want to conceptually divide, divide this now. So that device doesn't get confused into things that we're going to have to do versus things we may not have to do. So things that you're going to have to do, the, the best strategy is to attack them, get them out of the way as fast as you can. You're going to have to do them anyway. We might as well do it right now. And therefore we get to optimize our life experience with the, with the remaining time. That's a good way to do it. Otherwise, what I'm going to say is fiddle for a while. Okay. Fiddle for a while. Let's give ourselves some chance to watch this thing go up and smoke. So I might fiddle till the 15th of November, at which point 50% of the opportunity of this thing going up in smoke has passed. So now with each day that goes on, there's diminishing returns of procrastinating and an increasing cost of procrastinating because now what if there's a great backpacking trip that's going to take 10 days and it's just incredible people and there's some, you know, cute girl or guy that I'm interested in that's you know, going to go on that backpacking trip. And now I can't go because I don't have the 10 days available. You see? So what you want to do is you, you want to conceptually say, this is a fiddling thing that I may not have to do. So let's fiddle for a while to give it a chance. And then once we, once we get to something like a halfway mark, then it's time to assume that we're going to have to do it and just go ahead and attack it and get it out of the way. That's really the best way to run your life. Now, the, um, what will happen is with healthy living, you never have to do it. You never have to do it. Okay, so you get to procrastinate fiddle uh, if you want to. And that's a problem. Okay? Nobody's going to push you. There's no deadline. There's no huge cost. And so this is, this is when we have to get our act together and realize, now, wait a second, is this a priority? Because if it's a priority and we really want to do this and we want the benefits, then the right way to do it is to attack it. Okay, That means we get organized and get it done. We have a different attitude about it. So we don't, it's not like fiddle around and we're going to fiddle around and procrastinate and then worry maybe we're not going to have to cook after all. It's like, no, that's the wrong attitude. 
that attitude is, are you going to do it or not? And if you're, if we're going to do this, if it's a priority and you want to do this, then we need to attack it and uh, get in there, get your kitchen organized. If, if you're sitting around worrying about whether or not you're going to get your act together and cook tonight, then what you need to be doing instead is to um, go into the freezer and pull out that frozen soup that we made two weeks ago and put it in the microwave. That's what we need to be doing. We need to have, you know, if we're in that state, we already have to be ready for this position. So that, that's why this is a, you know, multifaceted, uh, uh, you know, education and, and um, operation in order to organize your environment and give you behavioral options that are consistent with your own inherent procrastination and laziness that will enable you to make good choices uh, when the little procrastination ship is tugging at your at your sleeve and telling you to go ahead and be a flight. Yeah, don't do it. Give yourself a better option there that's a backup plan. That's how you want to handle this. That's that's great. I was thinking of the question you answered just a moment ago about making exercise a daily habit. If you did it every day, it wouldn't ever be interrupted because of travel because you just did it every day. Yeah. It's funny because I don't care about you go to the hotel room and what do you do? You put on your earphones, you boot up your your, your music or, or whatever it is that you do, and you do 15 or 20 minutes of, of exercise to that and it's done. Okay, right. so there's just literally no reason. I can get 20 minutes of exercise standing in the back of a plane. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, a, a notion that this is a daily practice like brushing our teeth and you know there may be circumstances when you're injured or you're sick uh etc that you're not going to exercise that's fine but other other than that no it's it's got it's a priority and, right. and it's, it's a good decision to just do it yep i love it thanks i think we have time for one more question dr lyle from michelle she asks is self-hypnosis helpful in creating healthy lifestyle habits and if so what's the best method yeah um I, I hesitate on this for a number of reasons. The um, reason is, is that many people have done hypnosis and it's been helpful for them. The, the reasons it's been helpful is not because of hypnosis. It's because there was a, a confluence of factors that led that to be a, a moment in their life where they started changing a behavior pattern and then it, then it did. Okay, so a lot of those things will happen. Uh, your life has a lot of changes that take place, and you will change patterns when circumstances change. Now, let me give you a fantastic example. So the Surgeon General, you know, tearing his hair out, talked about how, I don't know, nicotine was tougher than cocaine, biggest force addiction. So I don't know what the guy said, but it's ludicrous. The, the truth is, is that as soon as they started making it so that you couldn't smoke in, a, in buildings, and all kinds of people that worked in high rises started quitting cigarettes. So the, the the use of cigarettes in the United States went from you know forty percent or so to like eighteen percent across a couple of decades, as state by state, one at a time. I think mean, led by California, probably or New Hampshire, who knows? The uh, made it illegal to smoke inside of buildings. So we got into too much trouble. The so now, oh, we're we talking about hypnosis. So the point is circumstances can change. So a person goes to a hypnotist and they want to change something clearly or they wouldn't be there. And they're spending money, okay? And they're, they're thinking this thing through. And then they go through, uh, you know, I don't know, watch the watch go back and forth, and get, have a little affirmation, et cetera. And then what do they do? They go home and they do it right. Good for them. Did the hypnosis have them do it? No. They got a lot of momentum, though, and encouragement and expectation that they're going to do this, et cetera. So they do it. They go, oh, I did it. Okay, then maybe they do it the next day. And then maybe they do it the next day. So now they've done it three, four days in a row. And they've got some cravings or whatever, but they pull it off. And so now what happens? Oh, they get through the extinction burst. 
they start to they, they get across the most difficult part of the, of, of the river. And so now they start to get into a groove. Did the hypnosis do it? No, it didn't. So there's there's no evidence anywhere in the study of, of uh, clinical hypnosis that indicates that this helps anybody change any habits, stop smoking, lose weight, anything else under the sun. Okay, um, and, and like, like I said, I'm getting cornered by this question publicly because I I don't want to take away the experience that people have had when they've had a problem, they went to a hypnotist and they wound up, they changed it. And it's like, well, hell, I went to a hypnotist and I'm better. It's like, I know it wasn't the hypnosis. It was an entire confluence of factors that were going on in your life. Your mind was doing a multidimensional cost benefit analysis, thinking hard about making this behavior change. Okay. You don't just a, an obese person with, you know, bad habits for eating doesn't wander into a hypnotist one day just for fun to try to get rid of the pain in their elbow. And the hypnotist says, well, let me do, I'll tell you what we're going to do while we're at it and we're getting rid of the pain in your elbow. Why don't we deal with the obesity? So let me hypnotize you so that you're going to eat less now. Do we think that this is going to make any difference? Of course not. Okay, we can take the master hypnosis of the universe. Nothing's going to happen. In fact, the master hypnotist of the universe was a man named Martin Horn uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, one of the most brilliant men that ever walked. Uh, Dr. Orn had a PhD in uh, clinical psychology as well as an MD and was a psychiatrist. So he was a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Dr. Martin Orn uh, was obese. And it turns out that I had a, we had a mutual acquaintance. <laughs> he was actually a, a brilliant diagnostician and, and was uh, the psychiatrist that was used in a famous case of the Hillside Strangler in Los Angeles, Kenneth Bianchi, uh, who had duped a bunch of other uh, mental health professionals and Martin Horn uh, uh, quacked the code and put Bianchi's feet to the fire and wound up resulting in his conviction. The, um, but uh, my, my friend who had a weight problem said to Dr. Orn, does it work for weight? <laughs> at which point Dr. Orn looked down at his own 150 plus pound uh, gut and said, I'm afraid not. <laughs> that is the story as far as that goes. Okay. That's beautiful. Dr. Lyle, everybody's been loving this so much. And, um, you know, maybe with your permission, this could even go on, you know, to wider audience. If, if you want, I can show it to you because it's it's brilliant as usual. And maybe you'll come back for the next couple of months, once a month, because you're, you're so helpful to our people. And uh, thank you so much. I'll put myself back on to say goodbye to everyone. Hey, we're both wearing blue today. Very good. And in that time, you and Alan were both wearing black. Wow, this is great. Twinsy. So thanks, Dr. Lyle. And thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, don't forget to tune in every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. to Dr. Lyle's show because one of your questions last night was answered by one of the people right here. You actually answered it as the first question. And you even said, yes, one of AJ's people, another hyper-conscientious nutcase. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> that was very nice to get that shout out. So thank you so much. Very good. My pleasure, AJ, always. Thanks, Dr. Lyle. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.